as a backup uh, for my heat, my hearing. I have to text me. Oh, oh there's said if there's okay. any any questions. Okay. So they can send me a text and I'll All right. Okay. You help that, Liz. Okay. Good evening and welcome to PNP Live. I'm Liz Hoddle, Director of Events and Marketing. Thank you so much for joining us here in this new space where we continue to bring vital conversations to our politics and pros community. At any time during the event tonight, you can click on the green button below to purchase books by either of tonight's authors on our website. Every single book that's purchased tonight will come with a signed book plate and we urge you to support us, Barbara and Gia by buying the books. Just buy some books. I know many of you already have copies of Trick Mirror, but I'm sure there is someone in your life that needs one. We can absolutely send it off to that person. Another way to support PNP tonight is by using the donate button at the bottom of your screens. We aren't charging for this program, but any contribution you can make so that we can continue our programming is so valued by us. You can ask a question tonight by clicking on ask a question, which can also be found near the bottom of your screen. You can also read other people's questions and even vote for the ones you like to hear answered the most. Um, if you have any tech issues tonight, sometimes it happens, uh, we recommend first, try refreshing your browser, two, switch over to Chrome if you need to, and three, try headphones, it, it helps. Tonight, we are here to talk about economic inequality in times of crisis, or um, the only thing, the only thing that matters right now. And no one in the world speaks truth to power like Barbara Ehrenreich. We've witnessed her refusal to accept easy answers in nickel and dimed and throughout her expansive career of investigation activism. Her determination to impart social change and economic reason is distilled in Had I Known, her new collected essays. Gia Tolentino has become an essential cultural processor for all of us through her work in The New Yorker and her collection Trick Mirror. During the COVID crisis, her work has taken on a more urgent and activist voice, culminating in a piece on the advent of mutual aid in this week's New Yorker. Both of these women are required reading for any informed citizen of our time. Please help me welcome Barbara Ehrenreich and Gia Tolentino to PNP Live. Oh, there goes Liz. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. Hi, everyone who uh, all these there's a thousand people listening. It's wild. No, it's incredible. Yeah. More than would be would be in the bookstore. If we were More than we could ever pull live. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's funny, like we were just saying before that it went live. I, um, if any of you guys haven't gotten had I known, I highly I highly recommend it as a commenter just wrote Barbara's the OG. Um, and all of the things that we're all thinking about right now, like how, you know, absolutely fucking ridiculous it is that there are billionaires and that our, you know, frontline workers are making this absurd minimum wage, all these things. Barbara's been writing about them, these things for decades. It was a delight to interview her. Um, I interviewed her for The New Yorker in the before times, which feels like the before times. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, um, and it's it's good to be able to talk now. I mean, I think for you and me, we're both a little bit biased. I mean, our brains naturally go to the fact that the story of class consciousness, the story of labor, like this is the single story of our country, right? I mean, I think we both are inclined to think that way. Um, but to me, do you, I, I wanted to ask you, like, do you feel like, how much do you feel like class consciousness has changed, has been at the forefront during the last couple of months? Uh, not enough. Really? Uh, no, I mean, I think it, it's unavoidable. You know, it, 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 you know, you can't avoid the fact that the stimulus package is aimed toward the big corporations. Right. And the wealthy. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, how people are absorbing this and beginning to try to act on it, well, that's that's the story, in which you did a great job on one uh, in this week's New Yorker. Thanks. What, what is it on, on mutual aid associations that are forming? Yeah. 
springing up spontaneously around the country, you know, just to help with the most basic things like groceries and um, getting people to the doctor, stuff like that. And I just love that piece. Thanks. <laughs> By the New Yorker or I don't know. Whatever you do to read these days. <laughs> well, you know, but actually working on that piece, it was interesting because I think, you know, yeah, it's it's true that the stimulus package, it's almost laughable. Like the twelve hundred dollars, it's laughable. And, you know, the fact that um like isn't the the emergency sort of mandatory sick leave, I think corporations that employ more than 500 people are exempt from it, right? Like there's just so many ways in which just the actual legislative negotiation of who's getting help right now is is an obvious nightmare. But that's what I mean. Like, I don't know if my perspective is swayed from having been speaking to organizers for so much of the last couple of months, but it seems to me like so many of these mutual aid networks are springing up because of this sort of in, like suddenly or increasingly very mainstream understanding that like the state's not, you know, the state's not doing its job. Like legislators aren't doing their job. Like, um, you know, like these mutual aid is the sort of organizing factor in disadvantaged communities. And now kind of, it, it's amazing to me how mainstream this idea is that we're basically living in a failed state, you know? And I, I kind of find that very heartening, but but you think that the it's not representative or something? Your article? No, no, no. Like, like, do you think that this, like, this sort of realization? You know, I mean. Yeah, no, that there's there's something. Um, <laughs> there's no government. Yeah, there's exactly. No government when it comes to the use of arms and armed right. force and prisons and things like that. But we don't have that. You know, we don't have a welfare state. Right. So we're completely unprepared right. for people uh, losing jobs en masse. And when we're looking at 30% unemployment, right, is the estimate now, right? Um, I can't even imagine that. Right. Uh, I was not alive during the, the Great Depression, but I heard plenty of stories. And and this this is much more unemployment than that. Right. Um, and of course, we don't have FDR as president. Right. Don't even get me started. On. <laughs> so no, this is um, it's it's hard. To, it's particularly hard to judge things about class consciousness and everything when we cannot congregate. Right. When we cannot see people in large numbers. Right. And, I, you know, a lot of my own history as an activist has been. Right. Involved crowds. Right. You know, that that's just and linking arms and marching down um, streets together. Yeah. Uh, and hugging and uh, <laughs> all kinds of things that are now strongly not advised right uh, so it's 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 hard it's hard to see uh and one of my my favorite organizer friends just you know he called me and said how do we organize now people yeah. need to get together people need to make bonds and and you know just whether it's a mutual aid society or uh, an action to put pressure on elected officials, whatever. Um, yeah. How do you measure that? I know. Well, you've been on the front lines talking to people. Well, you know, I think that, like, I've been thinking a lot about how radicalizing moments beget radicalizing moments, right? And, and I do think that, like, we have seen a pretty... And again, like I keep trying to fight against this sort of false, um, you know, it's like I'm always looking for class consciousness. So I think I'm, you know, trying to find it. But there are certain things, you know, um, like there are certain, there are certain aspects to the strikes that are going on right now that are reminiscent of the 30s, right? Like there are, 
um, you know, transit workers and hospital workers and warehouse workers. And, you know, uh, there, there is, there is still this, there's this rising discontentment that, yeah, we can't acknowledge it in sort of in each other's presence, which is, um, and it's this sort of confounding, unpre you know, I hate the word unprecedented. It's so overused right now. Yeah. But um, I don't know, there's certain things like, so for example, the fact that we're staring down, you know, 30% unemployment, maybe higher, right? Like to me, it's like, how can anyone come out of this and still believe that that health insurance should be tied to employment, right? Like to me, it seems almost impossible for anyone to come out of it think like thinking that we shouldn't have universal health care. But then I'm also like, Gia, are you like, are you being stupid again? <laughs> like, are you like, what do you what do you think about that? Well, the uh, you know we we know the bright side here is um that um things you know are we are learning that we right. that we're going to have, to having a government. Now I am not a statist. Yeah, I am not. Um, I sort of more lean more anarchistically in yeah. the mutual age yeah. direction. But um, th this is, you know, when, when you when you realize that that nobody is going to come to your aid, that nothing is happening, that's when you say we have to do this. Right, and that's the point we we should be getting to as a people as a world. Um, yeah, right. It was interesting for me reporting that piece to confront my own status leanings, you know, um, because I, you know, I guess for people who are listening, it's sort of like there's this fundamental tension between all of this work that people are now doing for each other, like Barbara was saying, you know, getting each other groceries making sure that they you know have access to like the like pharmacy trips or whatever and the, there's this question of are they doing what the state ought to be responsible for or what the state can has never done for many people and is not really showing any interest in doing and you know i i tend towards the statist point of view but it, in writing the piece i i was much more like hmm maybe this is a lack of political imagination on my part um so in terms of, you know, you, like, as everyone commenting is saying, like, I think, you know, Nickel and Dime is, was a formative, a deeply formative book in terms of many of us developing a consciousness of inequality and, um, you know, uh, like economic oppression. And to me, you know, we talked when we talked when I was interviewing it for The New Yorker, we talked about how the media often really fails at showing any sort of working class life, which is why you started the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, which is one of my favorite things going. Um, if anybody listening isn't familiar, like it's like many of my favorite stories every year are funded by um, ERP, as you can abbreviate it to. Economic Hardship Reporting Project. Yeah. Um, and, and to me, like I, I feel that um, in economic inequality has been pretty foregrounded by the media in this. Um, I, you know, surely not like- Has been what, foregrounded? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, people are still, will always talk about like, we're, we're all in this together and like this virus is a great equalizer when very obviously it is not, when, you know, black people are three times as likely to know someone that's died or, you know, whatever the statistic is. Um, in New York, I think three quarters of the frontline workers are uh, low income people of color. You know, the, the fact that so many of these low paying healthcare jobs are held by women, you know, to me, um, these facts have been pretty clear in media coverage. And I was wondering what, but what you think about that? Like, do you think, how do you think the media has done in reporting about Inequality. Well, uh, I n not so bad. Yeah. I mean, I, I I'm thinking, you know, seriously, mainstream, fake news, etc. Um, but I think that the New York Times and and the Post have been, been, have been, have been pretty good at, at 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 constantly bringing this up. Yeah. And and that's that's something. Now, are there any examples that spring to mind that you 
that you thought were like um well i just think the times coverage in general has been yeah. has been pretty good but you're the you're a better judge of these things you are at the front lines of journalism. No, I mean, listen, I'm in my bedroom like everyone. <laughs> wow. I mean, I thought like, you know, that, that MTA, there was the op-ed by the MTA conductor, um, that incredible op-ed that was exposing just, you know, how like hideously, like the, you know, transit workers have been treated. I mean, it, you know, it got a lot of, like it got a lot of exposure. The fact that, um, you know, I think that, like there was a, there was that really great piece on you know hosp healthcare workers including the lower paid like transporters and you know environmental services people like the people who are not you know not like the doctors and nurses necessarily like the people who are I, I, but i'm i'm also i'm also wondering how to what degree these narratives are reaching people that aren't already aware of right um well, we we keep trying. That's yeah, you right. do. that's our job. Yeah, <laughs> in a, in our in our different ways, um, it's you know I I feel very very frustrated that I cannot talk directly to large numbers of people. Now it, it's not that I'm a show off or want to be the center of attention, but you know, just to feel that I don't feel a sense of a platform yeah. and, uh, and the sense of people in interacting with me enough right now. Yeah. And I, I, if you're agreeing and, and you are much more out there right now than I am. Well, I think you're right that, I mean, there's a way in which just the deep, Frustration, like, you know, I mean, I th you think about those lines of people voting in Wisconsin, right? Or the people um, in South Carolina protesting Ahmed Arbery, like the the fact that it takes such extreme risk to put you to, to physically gather for even the most important purposes is kind of devastating for the kind of organizing that you want to see right now. But at the same time, so let's talk about Amazon organizing. Because um, I know your ex-husband has been involved with um organizing Amazon workers and we talked about it in our interview. And so I think really early on there, the Amazon workers in New York, I think were one of the earliest people to strike because someone at the facility contracted coronavirus. Um, and then Amazon retaliated, you know, you've seen this whole wave of companies retaliating against like nurses who have spoken out about the conditions. You know, I thought of your, um, I thought of your optimism book. There was like NYU Langone, like put out this internal communication that was like, um, please only put positive statements about the hospital on social media. Oh God, yeah. Um, but you know, in Amazon though, like it's been one of the most prominent, like it really try, it has really tried to stamp down on this worker organizing as it has for a long time, but it's gotten called out for it. The attorney general is gonna probably get investigate. Um, what if, what, uh, Talk to me about just what's going on at Amazon right now. Well, I can't really tell you, you know, as an insider or sure. anything, but I think what's happening is kind of amazing mm -hmm. uh, in that it's nationwide. It's entirely done by telephone and online. Right. Um, and it is attracting a very interesting, diverse mix of workers, which Amazon has, you know, right. people of all ages and uh, skin colors and um, uh, and nas different national backgrounds and everything. And it's it's a it's amazing that they just they get along, you know, that they're. Um, and that they're they're very excited, and they're moving from place to place, building on the success in other in other spots. Yeah, because yes, I mean, Amazon's response uh, to the 
promise or threat of reopening uh, has been to um, cut back, cut pay. Right. They were paying $17 an hour for new workers. And now that's they've, uh, that was $2 more than, uh, as of May 1st, that has been, um, <clears throat> I'm just looking this up. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the, the $17 an hour was being, was being, um, rolled back. In, yeah, okay. I think Kroger is doing that too, right? This like the heroes pay like lasted for 30 days. It's like, fuck these companies. <laughs> it's a while. Yeah. I mean, I think this, that's what I sense is going on in general. As people think about gearing up to going back to work, you know, possibly opening the factory gates and some whatever, again, um, the companies are thinking, hey, we're, we're doing them a favor. We're, quote, giving them jobs, jobs that they already had. And I, I hate that language, giving people jobs. People give you their labor, and <laughs> you get very little bet in, in right. return for that. Right. Um, so uh, there's, there's, there's this pushback now coming from the CEOs saying, you know, we've suffered a lot. We've suffered a lot during this crisis. We've seen our 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 stocks go up and down in crazy ways and so on. Now we need to be rewarded. And so the workers have to take a take a hit. Right. So you know it's um uh, well, I mean, one of the things they're fighting about at um, Amazon is um, getting paid some, some paid sick days. Right. Nobody seems to have paid sick days anymore. Uh, and these are, these are basic things that we have to be talking about for everyone. Right. I mean... Yeah, to me, it's just like, and I don't know if I'm if I'm just delusional here, but right, it's like the the fact that like just the the glaringly obvious, you know, sort of like blaring siren in the back of my head all the time, which is like America is the richest country in the world, and look, you know, and and we protect. There is it has the least safety net of any, you know. I mean, you would. It's it seems like how could anyone come out of this opposing universal health care mandatory? you know, sickly for everyone, not just, you know, companies, but then <laughs> all the things we don't have. <laughs> right. And yeah. then, and then you think about the election and then you just want to like, I mean, even, yeah, I can't even uh, think about that. <laughs> um, what have you, uh, what's, What's made you the maddest? Like, like you know, when we're just sitting, like, what has infuriated you most about, I don't know, like the last couple of months? Oh, um, lots of things infuriate me, um, unfortunately. Yeah, me too. Uh, I, I, I think the, the, the the attack on the working class that's going on now in the United States as a, as a whole infuriates me. Mm -hmm. um, it's taking people who, you know, have been underpaid and abused during their work lives for a long, long time and kicking them while they're down. Right. I mean, what more can be? What more can you do yeah. than, than die for your employer? Right. And that seems to be the the new deal. Right. You want a job? Be prepared to die. Right. And um, right. I, I don't even know where to start with this anger. Right. 
what how do, how do we how do we do this constructively <laughs> yeah and i think to me when i think about that one of the things that i think about is like one of the things i worry is that people you know people already see low wage workers as expendable people are already like there's already such there is this tendency on the part of the wealthy to dismiss poor people as deserving of this status, right? Like that if you don't, if you make $12 an hour, you that's because of some sort of like moral failing to be unable to make more. Whereas to me, it seems so clearer now than ever that, you know, everything is so arbitrary. It's so arbitrary that I still have a job, that I can work at home, that other people can't. It's has nothing, it's, it, it is, it is absolutely nothing to do with with worth. It has everything to do with accident, and and I and one thing that I worry about is that this will sort of cement that implicit understanding that people who work, you know, who have to deliver packages and check out grocery stores, that that's just like their job, you know, like that's that's what they do, and you know, and if you don't have to do it, it's for a reason rather than for no reason at all, really, and that that's a thing that fills me with a lot of dread. Um, but I also think maybe at you know at the same time there've got to be people for whom it's becoming much clearer that no one should have to risk their lives for you know for thirteen dollars an hour <laughs> like it's yeah yeah I yeah I I don't know what's going on with the, <laughs> with the consciousness of so many of our lawmakers and and. and if we're looking at something like 30% unemployment by July, right. that is worse than the Great Depression. Right. This is beyond our imaginings. We have no no welfare state, right. with no place to, no way of ca caring for these people medically. Uh, what have we been thinking? You know, what are we thinking? Right. I, I, I I, you know, I, I, I worry because I'm always a little bit apoc apocalyptically inclined. <laughs> Can't help it. My favorite things to read, you know, apocalyptic novels and so on. Um, and here it is. It's right in front of us. Right. And and um, we have to we have to get that mutual aid philosophy that you write about it in in the New Yorker this week um, it, it turn it into a, like a general class consciousness and, and by I don't mean to be to exclude too many people uh, when I say class consciousness I mean because yeah. there are a lot of people now who are going to see very hard times who never imagined right. that coming in their lives right but it was it was clear for me as soon as they started saying that some people could work at home, that was the, <laughs> that was the clue, right? You know, because who was going to work at home? The uh, FedEx delivery guy, right? Um, no, people like you and and I, right? We we get we get to work at home. Yeah, even just like the the racial disparities, it's like yeah, I think like like a, 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 a pretty strong majority of Asians and white people can work at home and it's the, and it's flipped for black people and Hispanic people. It's yeah. Well, you know, one thing, you know, I will say the thing that's made me the maddest actually, like that's not the sort of macro thing we're talking about. Have you seen the stuff where um, like, you know, obviously meat packing plants, right? This is, this is a job that's mostly done by immigrants. Um, it's, you know, it's sort of, farm working conditions where you you're necessarily kind of unsafe you have to be close to, close together and um did you see the i think it was the governor of south dakota saying that the outbreak among um meat packing employees was to, people. <laughs> yeah it's like due to like different social things that immigrants do <laughs> it's like oh oh is that why <laughs> like ah even I think like Alex Azar, I think the Secretary of Human, uh, I think he he said something like that too. Like th that's what you're saying. The sort of um, when you said the sort of it's like 
this idea that like our legislators are implicitly blaming the lower class for the things that have been, you know, for the boot that's been placed on their neck. Like it's, it's, it's ridiculous. No, but that's, I mean, that's been a theme on the right for, for so long. If you're poor, or if you if you're hard pressed economically, it must be because you're, you're doing something wrong. Right. You're not living right. You are having too many babies. Right. You're, um, you know, you're an addict. Whatever. You know, there's, there's all the all these ways of shaming the poor, which makes the the affluent feel very good because you can say, hey. I've done everything right. I got an education. Right. I did it right. But that's all about to change. I, I I just I if I look even two weeks into the future, I'm scared. If people are shooting at each other ever getting into a McDonald's dining room, um if they're shooting at each other because they're being told to socially distance in a, a do family dollar store, what next? I mean, we have an armed population, uh, at least the right wing part of it is armed, and uh, people are angry, right. and nobody is saying where did or where or how to direct that anger. Well, we are, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of my, I grew up in Texas and um, I think, you know, my, my mom works in a hospital system there and, you know, as the state reopens, um, I don't know, like to me, it's just like, is like, I, of course, I mean, you know, you don't want to dismiss, um, you know, I mean, it is like the portion of people who want to reopen the economy that you know, need money, but there's this, like, to me, just the, like the fact that you can't, like, as soon as these states started announcing to reopen, it was like, oh, okay, so here's a way to cut off unemployment, right? Like to cut off having to pay unemployment to people. And you think about people like, um, like service workers and nail salon workers, right? That like, they'll have to go back to work. They won't make any money because nobody's gonna come in and they can't get unemployment. And then it's just, that's that. Like that's the, that's the fix or whatever. What, what next? Right. That's when you pick up a brick. Right. You know, I mean. Well, maybe we pick up a brick in a good way, you know? <laughs> like I'm sort of feeling like that too. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you, you know, um, there are traditions of mutual aid you mentioned them, the history, yeah, somewhat in in your article, but I I really just wanted to throw in, uh, in here some more that the feminist movement, yeah, oh yeah, quite a tradition of self help and mutual aid, right? Um, we it's like around healthcare, mm -hmm. creating our own clinics, yeah, teaching women how to do their own uh, pelvic exams. And you know, it just saying we could, you know, if the if these doctors are going to remain so sexist and so racist, right. and we are going to do this for ourselves, we need that spirit, right? More, that we can do things. I feel the same way about reproductive rights. Yeah, it's easy enough uh, to uh, abort uh, a tiny fetus. Uh, fetus, but uh, you you know why why aren't we just saying we can take this into our own hands? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about abortion a lot lately. I mean, I'm trying to write, I'm trying to report out a really long piece about abortion access right now because it's like it's interesting to me. Like for some women, for a lot of women, for low income women trying to get an abortion 
always involves these like layers and layers of logistical obstacles that many people are now just understanding for the first time like oh it's very hard to leave my house it's very hard to get childcare i suddenly don't i don't have money to pay for it i have to travel but travel is difficult you know like there's a way in which for a lot of women this is always what it's like to get an abortion and i've been interested in um you know, so I've just been talking to people and, and speaking of exactly what you're saying, like I talked to a woman who had to fly from Texas to Colorado just to get the abortion pill at like seven weeks. And it was like, you know, she should be able to do telemedicine and get, get it in the mail. Like it's, it's extremely safe. Um, and, you know, just like things like that. But I, I, it, with that too, I've been encouraged, like they're the feminist roots of of direct aid to each other and direct um, support in where the state won't do it. Um, it's nice to see that those networks are, you know, nationwide and they're alive and they're prepping for the repeal of Roe and they're, you know, they're doing the work. But yeah, I mean, in, in like black communities and trans communities, right? Like mutual aid is the, is, is like the bedrock of human interaction, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, well, and as you wrote in the in nickel and dime, right? Actually, like I'm remembering, you know, like there's so many parts in that book where, where it's like, you know, people you're working with at like the diner, you know, if someone got kicked out of their, you know, their temporary housing, like they would be welcomed into like a coworker's, you mm -hmm. know, apartment, right? Like, um, like all we have is we can do and and mutual support to build on yeah among working class and, and low income people and i and i and i think sociologists have showed this statistically you know that um people who are poorer are much more philanthropic yep. much more likely to take in a, a person who has no place to sleep right all of those kinds of things and that's what we have to build on that impulse in people to come together in our yeah. times. I think I'm gonna, so we've got like 20-ish minutes left and I think I'll just pull up some of these questions. Um, okay, last time I did this, I didn't realize that the questions sorted by like how many people voted for them and I thought they were <laughs> chronological. So I'll start by the most, the ones that have gotten the most votes. Well, so, okay. This top question is sort of what we've been talking about. Do you both think the pandemic will change American attitudes towards the idea of the modern welfare state? Um, uh, wealth is synonymous with intelligence. Well, the, <laughs> that's one of the many myths. Wait, oh. <laughs> Wait, Wait, what are you reading? Hold on, are we reading different questions? I'm not reading anything. What are you reading? Oh, well, okay. Wait, so do you think the pandemic will change American attitudes towards the welfare state? I, I, I mean, you know, the Democratic Party has been pushed left, not nearly as far left as it should be, but I do think it will. But also I'm like, maybe I'm an idiot and have no idea about anything. Like... Well, I don't think it's it's all a good idea to make any kind of predictions. Right. I mean, I can only say I'm trying. Um, yeah. I. The next the next so question. You're asking, will the pandemic change attitudes towards the welfare state? Yeah, that's what this top question is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think maybe we should. Take anything pejorative away from that word welfare. Absolutely. Right now, it should have been done years and years ago. Yeah. Um. And and say yes, there are people who have, especially low income women of color, who have periods in their lives where they they need help. They need direct financial assistance, and there are people all of us and we need help at various times like if they were sick or we're trying to um buy a house or, or whatever you know what looms before us right have i answered that yeah um okay the next most the next most voted on question is 
Are you satisfied with the level of attention from the Biden campaign on this on these issues? <laughs> I <laughs> no. I like you good. I think like I was looking something up on YouTube earlier and like a Biden campaign ad popped up and I just wanted to put my head through a wall. Like I, I can't, I, the, the answer is like no to the, to the a degree I can't express right now. I mean, I, I will say he has gotten pushed left. Like the, you know, his, like his proposals are further left than I thought they were going to be, but I, I can't, I like, can't, I can't stand, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. What, what do you think, Barbara? No. I, I don't know. It was heartbreaking when um, Sanders stepped out. Yeah. Um, although, you know, I, 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 no, I can't go there. I can't get excited, yeah. unexcited, angry, anything about Biden. Yeah. You vote for him no matter what. That's what we old people do. We go, oh, creep out there and vote for one reason or another. But um, but with less and less conviction, I would like to vote for a socialist for president. Right. In the Democratic primaries in Virginia. And that was great. I love that. I don't think I'm even going to get to, because I think they're like trying to, like the primary in New York, I can't even... <laughs> um, the next question is, uh, this is a great question, um, and I'm glad that, Stephanie, that you brought it up. It's um, about access to public education, and how is, how is, uh, how did you put it? How is access to public education going to be changed for the disadvantaged by this crisis? Um, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about, um, this i've been thinking a lot about in particular like i i've like one thing i've been thinking about is how much zoom is in itself sort of a magnifier of economic inequality in a lot of ways like um i've just been thinking about all the college students who the low-income college students who get to college and it's supposed to be this institutional sort of equalizer and then all of a sudden this is just boomerang them right back into situations where like the differences between their home lives and their classmates' home lives are just vastly very obvious. And I've been thinking about that mostly at a college level for some reason, but you know, I've been thinking about like, I have friends who, one of my close friends teaches uh, public high school in the Bronx and she, you know, it's like a lot of her students don't have internet, you know, like they don't have internet at home. Uh, the ways in which um, advantaged children will be kind of bored and stressed. And I can't imagine how, bad, stressful that must be, but you know, they'll be okay. Like they have people watching out for them versus um, how deeply people on the other end are gonna be disadvantaged by this, you know, public schools being closed. I don't know, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, um, you, you have to answer some of these, you know that, Gia. <laughs> Kind of answering that. <laughs> I mean, I I think there are one of the things that's being revealed, if in case anybody ever forgotten, is how important public schools are as feeding centers, right, for a lot of children, because that's where you can get breakfast and lunch, um, or could. And what happened to that? What are those kids eating? Right. You know what's going on. So the, the 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 schools are sort of a wedge, a wedge of the welfare state. Right. That, you know, impacts everybody's life. Yeah. Well, this is one of those ways, especially when all the debates about like when for the week or so that it was, or maybe more than that, that it was up in the air in New York whether or not they were going to close schools. That's, you know, everyone kept being like bringing up the point that these are feeding centers, right? These, this is often like the, the most reliable meal that many of these students get a day. I mean, the homeless population in, in, in New York public schools is so significant. And, and to me, it was like, 
this is exactly, I mean, the ways in which income inequality are direct dangers to public, pu like the way that income inequality harms the public health of every single person in this country, like that to me was one of the most obvious examples, right? It's like, if, if, if schools didn't have to serve as feeding centers, then they could have been closed earlier and the epidemic in New York would look so different, you know? Um, it, it's just, it, it had like the, the domino effect, the, the, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so school, public schools have been a, a good advertisement for having an expanded welfare state. Um, right now, yesterday, last year, whenever, um, Otherwise, I, I, I don't know what happens when people get hungry. Well, in New York, at least, I think a lot of public, in New York, there are feed, like schools have opened as places where you can pick up a, a meal twice a day, um, which is good. But yeah, I mean, to that point, it's sort of like schools should not be the singular protective vector, you know, to make up for all the other programs that are lacking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, okay, here's the next question. How do we organize protest and action now when, as you say, we can't be together? Um, uh, the, the, the person who wrote the question wrote, um, there is a new sense of leverage somewhere. Like we have 1200 people attending this conversation, you know, like there's, there is energy right now. It's coming out some places. Activism doesn't necessarily need people in the streets, but it needs something. How can we, any thoughts on what, how we can organize right now, how to find that leverage? I think that people have been doing, to some extent, well, you know, here's one thing that I think about this. I talked to, a. I talked to some disability activists um, when I was reporting that mutual aid piece, because it's like, there are some activists who have always had to organize remotely kind of, and who have always had to learn how to provide services remotely. And it sort of reminded me that it is possible. Like it is, like this is one of those many things that some communities have been working out for a long time. Um, and there is like this, all of these mutual aid networks that have sprung up everywhere. Uh, there is, I think, an unprecedented amount of online organizing. But the question of where that goes, I don't know. I've been thinking about the limits of electoral politics a lot lately. Um, and I think that's that sort of disjunct that we're feeling, like, where does this go? It, it, it's not going, it's got to go somewhere new. Um, but also as someone whose natural leanings are like people physically together is what makes a movement. We really need some creativity in working on that. I, I mean, like talking to, um, I guess, Ama, uh, my friend who's uh, involved with the Amazon workers organizing, if they get a meeting, you know, in a, in a warehouse, or a fulfillment center, I should say. That's just such a good name. <laughs> um, you know, they, how do you choreograph that meeting? I mean, you, you, want, you want, we have to figure out how you can get people six feet apart, you know, in, a, in patterns that make sense and that are themselves symbolic of something. I am, you know, I'm at the limits of my imagination here. I'm a writer, I'm not a dancer. I can't figure out the choreography of protest, but this is like new kinds of things we have to be thinking of. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in the rent strikes that have been, um, like, you know, the May 1st rent strike. I like the, the Overton window is opening a bit for things like that. A lot of that has been organized online. Um, 
yeah, I, it's, it's, it's hard to, I, I'm finding it especially hard to think about this at a time when like, I mean, it's really hard to deny the centrality of physically being together, you know, even just for our like existential lives, you know, let alone politically, right? But um, I have well, been. The, uh, it's, it's the symbol for DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, or was anyway, um, which is two hands joined, a, a brown hand and a white hand. and. Um, you know, that, that linkage, that flesh to flesh, skin to skin linkage is so much for us a part of being together. And, you know, we say, I'm, I'm here with you. Um, that's how we do it. Now we need all you smart young people to figure out new ways to do it too. Yeah. <laughs> um all right oh man this the next most voted question is very to the point okay barbara are you ready does the modern american working class i mean you've been writing about this for so long does the modern american working class have a breaking point or are we destined to have the boot stamping on our face forever whoa who well, asked that question my name is just Jeff again. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's the that's the question. We don't know where that breaking point is. We never do with people. Uh, you know, pre-revolutionary situations are awfully hard to figure out. Um, and things could go different directions so quickly. Um, so I don't make predictions, but I do think there's a definite breaking point when you can't pay the rent and you can't put food on the table. And that's, I mean, that's the point where you sort of walk out the door and into the street and try to make trouble. Yeah. I mean, that's the, 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 the only weapon you have at hand then is disruption. That may be the only thing we we can do. As my 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 friend and role model, Francis Fox Piven, the political scientist, puts it, you know, you you've got to get out in the streets, you've got to disrupt to get attention. So I listen to Francis. Yeah. In terms of disruption, one of the movements that I've been most interested in is Moms for Housing in Oakland. Uh, you know, in terms of just talking about dis direct disruption that has worked, it's really amazing. It's so funny. There are all these people in the comments arguing about how I need a vocal coach because I say like too much. You guys, you don't have to, you don't have to keep watching. <laughs> um, people are liking you as you speak. No, they're telling me that I, that I, that I say like, and you know, too much that I, that I need a, a speech coach. <laughs> I think you speak fine. <laughs> I think writers should be read and not seen, but sometimes we have to do these things because, you know, that's just, uh, that's just, that's just how it is. Okay. Um, can you both, can you make some reading suggestions of books that influenced you? Um, yeah, let's say, what was your nickel and dime, Barbara? <laughs> God, you know, I, I, I don't have one book. I was a compulsive reader as a child. I read everything. Um, and fiction, nonfiction. And I think that formed me a lot as a writer. But what formed me politically was probably more my, my family background, which was yeah. blue collar um, uh, mining family, actually from Butte, Montana, originally we were. So that had a, an impact that I didn't really even begin to sort out until I was in my 20s to realize that there were classes in American society and I was in one and it wasn't, I came from one that wasn't very good. 
to be from. Um, and today, I'd have to say that one of the things that outrages me the most among liberals and people on the left, even, is um, there'll be a kind of contempt for working class people. A contempt for them, which they would recognize if it were in strictly racial terms. Right. So, for example, they'd recognize it as racism. But the word classism is so weak and doesn't speak at all to what I'm talking about. You know, we have to, we have to get back to that. Yeah. I think, um, I'm trying to think, well, nickel and dime is pretty formative for me. Um, I, I think, you know, books like evicted, evicted is so, um, ghetto side evicted, um, random family by Adrian Nicola Block is to me one of, it's like one of my favorite nonfiction books ever. And to me, actually, like, that's the book that, like, if, like, all the boring ass high school reading that people have to do, like, instead of all this Chaucer, like, they should be reading Random Family and Evicted. And, you know. Um, I haven't read Random Family. Oh, really? I think you'd really, really, really like it. I loved Evicted. Yeah. It was, it, was, it hurt to read, but it, I loved it. It was a great book. It well, is. It's like, I mean, I think that all these books, they speak to the actual, you know, the actual facts of income inequality. They're not, they're not dry. They're not, they're not, they're not like these statistical things that we're talking about in the abstract, like income inequality is this deeply human, emotional. I mean, I think that's what you portrayed. It's, it's this sort of deeply human, um, like like all these books about income inequality or these books about just what it is to be like a human who wants things, you know? Um, I think that's why those, that's why the, that's why these books left such an impact on me. Um, maybe let's do one more question at 657. Um, okay. How as journalists, writers, or citizens, can we help reframe the narrative away from what the corporate right has managed to frame it as for decades? Um, I don't know. <laughs> How do we do it, Chia? <laughs> well, okay, let me pull up something that I thought was really amazing. Um, to me, I mean, I have no idea. It's like, you know, you, you try to do your best every day and that's all you can ever do. Um, but, okay. Actually, I have a better answer for this question. I think that, you know, I grew up with most of the people I knew growing up are extremely conservative. Um, oh, I think what? are very, very conservative. Um, mm -hmm. You know, certainly don't believe in universal health care or, you know, all these things that, you know, think that the minimum wage is fair, you know, right to work, whatever. Um, and I think, I think that, you know, there's just, increasingly, I mean, there's never been any time to fuck around, but we're really, there's really no time to fuck around now. And I have been kind of heartened, at least in the last few months, at how much more plainly people are putting things. Um, like there was this, I was like, this kind of went around Twitter that it was sort of surprising that the New Yorker published this, but there was a Kim Stanley Robinson piece in the New Yorker um, that was just, I can't find it. Oh no. Um, it's just like a, the quicker that the quicker that and more directly that people can call bullshit. You know, it's like we we just like can't beat around the bush at all anymore. I um, mean, you never have though. So <laughs> no, I, I think it's possible to speak more plainly than yeah. we ever have. Um, it's possible to say, yeah. Socialism, so that's a general direction I want to go in. Yeah. And things like that were un unthinkable. Some things were unthinkable even, oops. Um, okay, uh, sorry, uh, my technician is helping me here. Um, 
so I sort of lost the train there. Um, you said some things were unthinkable. Oh, well, the, I mean, even, you know, to talk about Medicare for all, right? you know, socialized medicine, that was unthinkable a few weeks ago. Now, how? what's the alternative? Right. We have no alternatives. No sane ones, anyway. Where's the... Up to you. If I'm having a, a last word here, I want to say um, it's people like you, Gia, who give me a great deal of hope, as does my technical assistant here, who is my very own daughter, Rosa Brooks, and who is also a writer and troublemaker in many, many ways. So consider the, the torch past. That's an honor. Huh? I don't think I, you know, I, I don't know if I'm worthy to carry that torch. But you know, what, while you were talking, if I'll, 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 if I have a last word too, I think one thing I've been thinking about, and in terms of how to how to frame socialism as the way I think it should be framed, I forget someone wrote a piece recently about how Americans are so used to accepting this abstract idea of freedom in exchange for a just a deep lacks of actual freedom, right? We accept the abstract freedom to work instead of the, instead of the concrete freedom to be protected in the workplace, right? We accept mm -hmm. the abstract. And I think that like there are so many ways in which, yeah, these, as that person who wrote the question said, these, these ideas of the, the basic idea of, of freedom has been co-opted when in fact to me, right, freedom means, freedom means, Welfare, it means security, it means a safety net. Yeah, you gotta start with some security. Yeah. <laughs> um okay, well I think that concludes our hour. I'll turn it back over to um Liz. Hi. Hi, hi again. Um thank you so much for engaging this conversation with us. I feel like it's we could I know the people that are listening and I could listen to you talk pretty much every day. Um dealing with these these topics. So thank you. And thank you to everyone that's listening. Um, just a reminder that um, we put on these events out of love, but we do need your support. And so do the authors. You can click down here to buy both books and you will get a personalized book plate. And you can also click on the bottom to donate to our programming, which allows us to keep bringing you programs like this. We have a lot of other programs coming up. Tomorrow, we have Lawrence Wright with Jane Mayer. Um, Monday, we have Bakari Sellers in conversation with Kamala Harris and a bunch more. So check out our website for more information. Thank you, Gia. Thank you, Barbara. Stay well and stay well read. Thank you, Barbara. And thank, thank you guys for listening. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>